What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? What is up? My name is Anthony, and you guys are tuned in to VR Roundtable. Yes, we are at episode 114 of the show. And today I am joined by Gary and Chris. Steve is on vacation. Where is Steve, Gary? Do you remember? I forgot. Uh, I think, I think he, was he was going away with, with some friends. I'm not too sure exactly where he went, to be honest, but uh, he's, he's around somewhere anyway. anyway. <laughs> okay, because he's definitely a jet setter. He'll be in Ireland or Switzerland or something. You know, he, he bounces all over the globe, which is pretty awesome. I would love to be able to do that. Although, you know, all the plane flights get annoying after a while. But Gary, how is it going there? I know you're kind of under under a little bit of heat and pressure right now because you are handling the, the feed and all of that. Uh, what's the latest? Yeah, um, that's right. And actually, thank you to everybody for uh, just commenting in chat because I'm getting a little bit of echo. I should be okay now, hopefully. Um, I didn't see that one. Um, yeah, I'll, Steve, I, I mean, Steve, I'm livid, Steve, honestly. <laughs> How dare you have a week off? Um, yeah, but no, he deserves it. He's, uh, he's, he's doing well. Um, any problems with the stream, then please let us know. I'm doing my best to uh, get everything uh, audio-wise and just stream-wise sorted out. Um, so hopefully it will be a good show either way. But feel free to comment in, uh, in chat and I'll try to sort out any problems you get. Fix it, Gary. <laughs> yeah, and we also, of course, have Chris checking in. Chris, how's it going, man? I know you're hyped, bro, for that HoloLens 2.0. Are oh, you man. watching it every second? I'm trying to. <laughs> Just talking about all this other non-important stuff, as always. Uh, but I'm doing good. Um, it's exciting this week. We're working on getting networking into our, our VR game we're working on uh, for, for school here. So we got networking working. So that's fun. You can, like, pass rocks and stuff between players <laughs> oh sweet okay well anyway guys we have a number of news stories to get into and i did want to mention really quickly that right now mobile world congress 2019 is popping off in barcelona spain right now and microsoft is actually on stage right now and they have a number of different people talking and we'll, we'll keep an eye on that because i know that at some point in time, we are probably going to find out about HoloLens 2.0 and, uh, you know, redesigned HoloLens 2.0. And actually for us, although we're interested in that to a certain degree, we're actually much more interested in the possibility that we might find out about Windows Mixed Reality 2.0, possibly a new reference design for a new VR headset. Who knows? Probably not going to get that, but... I'm still excited for it anyway. So we will break into that kind of news if it happens. And you guys in chat can also let us know if something gets announced, like a price or field of view or things like that. Go ahead and let us know in chat, and we can comment on that quickly as well. But let's go ahead and get into our news stories for this week. Oh, one other thing I do want to mention is we do have a lot of viewers from VR365, which is this little show that I do uh, seven days a week, and I cover the news every single day. And I know last week when, or maybe it was the week before, we were doing a VR roundtable episode, and a lot of people in chat were like, this is old news, this is old news. And I just wanted to explain, guys, that our VR roundtable audience is a different audience, and some of these people never watch VR365. Unfortunately for them, they should subscribe. But uh, some of them know nothing about that, and this is their weekly news. And so we go over stuff that happened last Monday, stuff that happened last Tuesday, last Wednesday. Basically, VR Roundtable is going to cover every significant news story that happened since our last show. So apologies for those of you that are constantly keeping up with the news and you think this stuff is kind of old, but we have this is the way we do things. So try to understand if you could as far as that goes. But let's go ahead and get into the number one topic. And this is way back on Monday, I believe, is the, and I have a problem pronouncing this. I'm going to say Varho. I'm just going to say Varho. And if that is wrong, that is wrong. What I'm talking about is the Varho VR1 Retina Quality Fixed Foveated Display. It was officially announced, officially unveiled. I believe this is back on Monday. Six 
$6,000, $6,000. Also, what we understand with this is this is not marketed to end-level consumers. This is marketed towards enterprise. This is marketed towards location-based. Actually, really what it's marketed for is not even location-based entertainment or VR arcades. It's more marketed towards major corporations that are designing new cars, new planes, new trucks, planes, trains, and automobiles, right? And they're designing it with these headsets because it allows them to do things in a couple of months that may have took them nearly a year to do normal now that they have these VR headsets. And the thing about Varho VR1 is the incredibly high resolution. So this headset is basically combining two different screens. There's a screen within a screen. So you got a smaller screen that is in the middle and then it's 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 implanted on top of a bigger screen. The smaller screen, incredibly high resolution, 60 pixels per degree, which is 20 times the pixel density of any current VR headset. And then you have the outer area, which is very similar to an HTC Vive Pro or a Samsung Odyssey. And so that's the idea here. Now, I have my own issues with this. There's also eye tracking. It's a fixed foveated display. Uh, why don't I go ahead and send it over to Gary? Gary, I know you've seen some of this Varho VR1 headset. You've seen the news of this. What were your thoughts when you first found out about this whole thing? Um, it's exciting just to get another VR headset, honestly, in any kind of space. And this seems to be, you know, it's entirely put, uh, aimed towards indus industry, uh, commercial use and that kind of stuff. It's not really for a consumer appliance at all, which is fine. Um, but to push the industry forward, I think we need headsets like this. Um, one of the things I, I remember seeing... Uh, a new story about the it was either this headset or something very similar where it was um it used the same technology like a micro display um which was reflected with a mirror which moved it, the mirror was on motors and then it was almost like a foveated rendering kind of kind of display this is using fixed foveated rendering so the center of the vision um i believe is sort of ultra high resolution and then the surrounding is not whereas um the kind of headset that I would expect from this would be more of a, a eye tracking foveated rendering based device where it would sort of maneuver the, the central uh, high resolution image around where, where you're looking. This isn't that um, by all accounts anyway, but uh, either way, you know, it's, it's an interesting headset and I... Again, I'll just go back to the fact that I think it's it's good that, that there are companies making this kind of headset. And I suppose it's more interesting from the point of view that we can sort of throw all this stuff out there. These, these companies, they're investing a lot of money in all of these different directions. And for us as consumers, I think it's interesting to see what sticks. You know, they're, all of these companies throwing stuff out there, it's interesting to see what sticks to the walls um, and where that will take us in terms of a consumer product. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, Chris, you know, when you look at all the details here, one of the details that jumps out at me is an 87 degree field of view. And then also the fact that the really high resolution area is 60 hertz and the outer area is 90 hertz. Do you worry at all? Like if you were to try this headset, do you think you would notice the, 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 you know, the, the borders of the super high res and the lower res, or do you think like you'd be so involved in the experience, you won't notice any difference? Yeah, I, I do think that's like a concern. It's not ideal by any means. There's a picture in the article, uh, on a, on a uh, road to VR that has kind of like the screen and then like a, like a little shadow around it, this, the, the center screen, and then it's the rest of it in its screen door glory. Uh, so I, I don't think it's ideal by any means, but I think that this company is just like, you know, we, we know there's enterprise people who are going to pay whatever they possibly can to have a higher resolution in the middle of a headset. Like, let's just make something ridiculous. You know, it always just brings me to, I wish companies like this made consumer headsets. I don't even care what, like, if it's worse than this, you know, if they could make a headset for $500 that was 
you know, it's Steam VR 2.0 would be an actual other competitor to the Vive. So, like, I just wish a company that's focusing on enterprise, like, thought about retail for a few minutes. But uh, it'd be, you know, once again, this is like, it'd be super cool to try something like this to see what it's like to have basically retinal resolution in the middle. I wonder if you would really notice if you're looking straight ahead, if you notice that the rest of the screen is, is has the screen door or not, because really, you know, if you if you look at something, you really can only see detail in the very middle of your vision. So it'd be interesting. Maybe it's better than we think, or maybe it's worse than we think. We'll have to find out. Also, one thing is I'm watching the the live stream of Microsoft, and they just announced the new Connect, which is kind of cool. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, I yeah, I'm watching it as well, and people are like, Connect, really? Like, how dumb is this? But you know, we actually in the VR world. We need a really, really, really high-end Kinect device that we can set on the outside for full-body tracking, you know, for real-time full-body skeletal tracking for VR. That's actually something we need in the future. Like, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I feel like, because, like, people will talk about field of view. They'll talk about higher resolution. They'll talk about foveated rendering, eye tracking, oh, all these different... Oh, lens. <laughs> oh, they're, they're showing it? The new one? Yeah, it continue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, people are interested in all these different things, right? But what about like putting our actual bodies into VR? Like I always talk about that because I feel like we're the headless horseman, you know, or not. I mean, we're like the invisible man. We've got a head and we've got floating hands and that's all we have. And I think if, if you're like looking down at your body and you really saw your body and it was really proportioned properly because we've all played these inverse kinematic things where like your body's over here and it's over there and it doesn't feel right. But yeah, so we'll have to see what happens with that, but we'll keep our eyes on that. But why don't we go into our next story of the day? And that would be HTC has unveiled the Vive Focus Plus. And so we've got another HTC Vive. Uh, well, a, not a, I guess, yeah, HTC Vive. It is HTC Vive. It's the Vive Focus Plus. We've got another headset that has been added to their catalog, their stable of headsets. And basically what we're looking at here, folks, it is the Vive Focus, but now it has built-in six DOF controllers right at the very beginning. So it's it's pretty much what the Vive Focus probably should have been. And now this can compete head-to-head -head kind of with the Oculus Quest. The question is, which one's going to be released first? I kind of feel like the Quest is actually going to beat it to market. But Gary, we saw the Vive Focus Plus, six DOF controllers. They seem to be aiming this more again at enterprise. This is what we keep hearing over and over again, not really thinking about consumers here. What are your thoughts of this? Um, not too much to say, honestly. It's not it, I, because we heard about this. They were working on these six DOF controllers for a while, and it's direct competition to the Oculus Quest. Um, although, is it? You know, that's the question for me. I'm not too sure whether it is actually direct competition because, as you mentioned, Anthony, they're going more for the, like the industry kind of um, requirement for this device where. It's not really for consumers, so I don't know. It's it's exciting that there are mu uh, multiple there are multiple companies going in this direction. The the standalone direction, the Oculus Quest, the HTC Vive Plus, um, uh, Focus Plus, sorry, and. I think that's generally the way that a lot of companies will probably go with this. However, this particular device, it's it's a higher cost device. It's going to be far more than the oculus quest it's not aimed at that market so you know i i guess it's difficult for me as a consumer to get a look too excited about really you know one thing i should probably mention is actually maybe even bigger news than the vive focus plus another thing that we found out at um when they unveiled this is that there is going to be something called the vive ecosystem conference which is coming in late March. Um, it's going to be, you know, after GDC and I believe after PAX East in Boston, it's timed right around there. We're going to have this Vive Ecosystem Conference, the VEC. Hey, we all know about the VEC, right? Chris, don't you think, though, this is a great idea? Because let's face it, there's a lot of these companies out there 
they have like 10 different headsets. Don't you think they maybe need to like just settle in on four of them and and concentrate their efforts? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, once again, uh, Vibe doing the weirdest things possible. Like, it sounds like this is totally enterprise and it's like, come on, guys. You know, they're probably going to release pricing for this and it's going to be like $600 or something. I want a competitor quest so bad. It just seems like no one else can do it. Uh, but, you know, I think it's good that they'll have this conference maybe they can simplify their lineup at this conference or convention um let's hope yeah but overall it's it's just weird like i i think it's good that they're they're starting to work on six degree of freedom uh controllers for mobile and stuff like this um you know it's it's like the the google dev kits that we talked about a while back except they're actually like going to be in a product soon which is cool i haven't heard anything from daydream about those yet so this could potentially come out before even that. Um, but if anything looks like a quest competitor to me, it's like the daydream uh, six degree of freedom stuff. Okay. Yeah. And another thing about that Vive ecosystem is we still haven't gotten any additional Vive Cosmos news. You know, they announced that at the January CES and they said there'd be much more information in the coming weeks and months. And it's been all quiet on the Western front. Now, HTC is actually at Mobile World Congress, but I don't know if they're going to say anything there, but we'll have to see what happens with that. All right, the next story we can go to is Nintendo. Nintendo is getting into VR in a major way. I wish. I don't know about that. But basically, the report is that actually there's legitimate rumors that are going on behind the scenes about the Nintendo Switch and VR. And I don't have the story in front of me right now at the moment, but I know there, um, there's a, uh, God, what is her name? There's a lady that works at, I think, Nintendo World Report, and she is famous for basically having the inside scoop at Nintendo. And she's the one that started talking about this, and she's been right a lot of times in the past. And so it's kind of one of these things where, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? So if Nintendo is whispering about VR, there has to be something going on here. At the same time, we all know that the resolution of the Nintendo Switch, if you were to take a Nintendo Switch and divide that screen in half, you're talking about damn near Game Boy, uh, Virtual Boy resolution, you know? I mean, you're talking Headache City. However, there's also rumors that there could be an upgraded version of the Nintendo Switch that switches from a 720p screen to a 1080p screen. And that maybe this Nintendo Switch is the one that is going to feature VR support. Um, Gary, looking at this Nintendo Switch article, I mean, looking at this, the possibilities of VR on the Nintendo Switch, there, there are these rumors here, but it doesn't seem like it would work. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's difficult. I think they could get it working now. Now, part of this report as well, they do go into... So the, the original report came out for Nintendo World, um, but then there was a follow-up from Go Nintendo. I'm not familiar with either of these publications, if I'm being honest, but uh, they said that it was probably going to be part of Nintendo Labo, which is, you know, it's cardboard. It's like a... So my thought is maybe they could put together some kind of device which is a Google Cardboard kind of equivalent with the Nintendo Switch in, which would work, it would work, it's low resolution, it will be low quality VR, but it would work. Um, so I don't really see too much of a reason for them not to do that, really. From Nintendo's point of view, they're not particularly passionate about VR, they're not particularly enthusiastic about the future of it or where it goes by all accounts, so why can't they just compete in a very half-hearted way and just create something which is a labo device you buy a cardboard kit you put it on your head and you enjoy vr um i don't see why they wouldn't do that um i don't you know i suppose as vr enthusiasts we all think that's not the best way for them to do it but um i don't see them uh, thinking in that capacity honestly yeah, Chris, I mean, we've always thought of Nintendo as a company that is focused on children, you know, um, like Nintendo. Nintendo's market is like from six years old to about 14 years old. That seems to be like their core target market. And then also, of course, man children, <laughs> 35 and 40 year old men that just love Nintendo like none other. And they got their switches ready to go. 
Um, do you believe, because like when we look at PlayStation VR and we play a PlayStation VR game, there's a warning that comes on the screen right before you start. And it says something about you shouldn't be under 12 years old. You know, it's like 12 years and up. Like if you're 11 years or younger, it's not suggested. And the reason we have these warnings, there's no actual studies or anything that show anything, but it's just from a standpoint of like the muscles in our eyes. And so I guess when you get to the age of 12, 12 years old, your muscles are fully developed. And so from a from a legality standpoint, Sony and all these other companies feel like it's okay if you're 12 and over. Do you think part of the reason maybe Nintendo has like not had much interest in VR is because of their target demographic? It definitely could be. Like, I mean, they still did come out with the virtual boy all those years ago. I it's it's hard to tell because the Switch is kind of this weird thing where there's a lot of children who who use it, but then there's also like a lot of people who are getting back into Nintendo from the Game Boy era. So there's like kind of a lot of people my age who have Switches as well who would like VR, I think, a lot. Um, but, you know, like you said, it, it would basically be Dev Kit 1 if, if they made this a, like a VR headset, the current Switch today. Um, but I think Labo makes sense because then Nintendo can be like, hey, we're just... You know, we're just experimenting with it and we're, you know, letting kids or not kids, but maybe teenagers build their own VR headsets and see how they work or something. Uh, it's it's weird with the Labo, though. Like, I, I I don't know if I see that too much just because, like you said, like Labo is 100 percent for kids. Like with Labo, you can't have anything offensive whatsoever or else you can't use Labo peripherals uh, from what I've found out. So, like, you can't really even have a game with a gun in it and like using Labo. Like, that's just doesn't work uh, with their their guidelines for Labo. So VR would be a really interesting thing. Um, I'm kind of doubtful that that would happen, but that's also at the same time the best way they can do it if they make a Google Cardboard type thing because you know they're not going to be serious about this stuff. Uh, so we'll have to see. Like, I hope they get into VR. Um, I still don't even think the Switch is powerful enough to run anything that substantial. But then again, the Quest is going to come out, so... They might want to get into that market a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, what I've always thought with Nintendo and VR is like you play a game like Astrobot and you immediately think, oh my God, has Miyamoto seen this game? Has he sat down and played this game for five minutes? Because that's the thing where it's like, Nintendo, you got to do this. But I do feel like it's probably another five years away. So we'll just have to see what happens there. But let's go ahead and get into our next story. Now, Windows Mixed Reality, this is in the news in more ways than one. Obviously, we got the drama that's going on right now at Mobile World Congress. They are showing off the new HoloLens 2.0. It is considerably smaller. The field of view appears to maybe be doubled and stuff, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But one of the things that we heard earlier this week is, I believe it was a tech tech radar story, I, I mix up Tech Radar and Tech Crunch. So this is Tech Radar. And one of the things they talked about is on the Microsoft website where they sell these mixed reality headsets. They have, of course, the Acer, Lenovo, Hewlett Packard, the Samsung headsets, et cetera, et cetera. They have this reference design that all these different companies are selling headsets based on this reference design. Now, we found out that Microsoft is no longer paying a commission on sales of these Windows Mixed Reality headsets. And this is kind of like one of these things where we normally wouldn't find out about this, but you might go to like a Best Buy or something and, and the, the guy's ringing something up and then he'll notice, hey, there's a little code here, which means this product's being discontinued, you know, and, and you find out some kind of hidden information like that. And that's kind of what this sounds like to a slight degree. And there is some panic a little bit of panic out there that people are saying, oh my God, Microsoft is basically dumping mixed reality. They're getting out of this entire mixed reality thing. But I think we're probably reading way too much into this little news blurb. It's almost a, a click baity kind of a news blurb, if anything. Gary, what do you think? Do you think there's any chance that Microsoft would just say, forget it, we're done. We're done with Windows mixed reality. It's not selling well. It's too much of a headache. Would they just completely walk away from it? Seems kind of crazy. 
I'd be very surprised if they do that um, because it doesn't make sense for them. They've got such a, I mean, to me, from the outside, it seems like they've got a relatively low investment in Windows Pixiality anyway. They're, they're, they're outsourcing to third parties and relying on third parties to uh, produce these devices, which, which makes sense for them. So I don't really see them backing away from VR or, well, certainly not AR. You know, Windows Mixed Reality is a whole platform. It encompasses HoloLens and virtual reality as well. There seems little reason for them to back away from it in the long run. Um, now, that's not to say that they're not um, possibly, you know, playing the long game with this stuff. Um, I don't think we need to panic about them moving away from VR or AR, but uh, I, yeah, I think they're playing more of a long game with this kind of stuff. Yeah, Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Gary. I think they're, you know, they're playing the long run, and also this, you know, there has to be a second Windows Mixed Reality version at some point. So maybe this just leads to good news that version two could be coming on the horizon, which is what we can all hope for. So. Yeah, that's personally my hopes because we've seen a number like for example, we if if Windows Mixed Reality was killed, then what the heck is the Hewlett Packard Copper because that's supposed to be a Windows Mixed Reality headset and that's a new prototype that features 2160 by 2160 per eye, which I think my next headset like we we've talked about this a little bit about like what next headset do you want to get? And for me, I've heard of a number of rumored headsets that have this 2160 by 2160 per eye. And if that's actually legit, I think that's my next headset because that is a significant jump, I think. Um, yeah, so. Also, um, really quick, I just want to say that Windows Mixed Reality has been like increasing a lot in the Steam hardware surveys. Like It seems to be the most growing market, kind of. like It's almost at 9% of VR headsets or that. So that's kind of a lot. It's like almost 1 in 10 people have... Windows MR, so that's something to consider. Like they're they're doing good now. Like they're finally getting a, a grip on the market here, which is good. Absolutely, and there's always good deals on it. Sometimes you can grab one for about two hundred bucks. Okay, um, now we have some Hololens news, and not not the news that's going on right now in Mobile World Congress, but we've got some different Hololens news, and this is a interesting story here. Um, so. Yesterday, uh, a story broke about Microsoft workers being in, very, very upset about this contract with the U.S. Army. And they're basically demanding that Microsoft end their contract with the U.S. Army. And so there's this letter, there's like 100 different signatures from every, from all kinds of different Microsoft employees that worked on it. And it's basically, I'm looking at the article right here, and it says, on behalf of workers at Microsoft, we're releasing an open letter to Brad Smith and Satya Nadella demanding for the cancellation of the IVAS contract with a call for stricter ethical guidelines. If you're a Microsoft employee, can you sign at blah, blah, blah. And it says HoloLens for good, not for war. And basically what they're saying here is um, they're saying that all these engineers have been working all this time on the original HoloLens, and they were working on it with this idea that you're going to use the HoloLens to help people build better cars, better airplanes, to do architecture, to have incredible mixed reality gaming experiences, entertainment, all this stuff. But now Microsoft has entered into this contract with the U.S. military, and the reality is, is that the HoloLens 2.0 is actually going to allow the U.S. military to be an even more lethal killing machine. And it's also going to kind of video gamify um, being on the battlefield. And at first, you know, honestly, when I first heard about this, I thought, oh, my God, these people are like, you know, calm down. You know, this is just normal. This is like the way of the re the world. You know, this is like you know, businesses do these kinds of deals and there is military. And, and, and I thought, you know, this is all normal, but I started reading more and more of it. And I started thinking, you know what, they kind of do have a point here, actually, because you, you start putting these headsets on everybody. It's kind of like the drone thing. Like, you know, these drones that fly around, you have somebody in some kind of underground bunker in Idaho 
that's flying a drone that's flying all around Afghanistan. And you wonder if killing, like actually killing somebody remotely, like you're almost playing a video game, you know, there's like a desensitization, de, uh, you know, desensitizing that's going on there to some type of a degree, you'd have to imagine. So I think these Microsoft employees, they have a bit of a point here. But then on the other hand, you know, Microsoft is a for-profit company. They have shareholders to answer to. They've been spending billions of dollars on research and development into these fields. They finally get a contract for almost half a billion dollars from the U.S. military, and they're going to say no to that. So, man, this is a conundrum like no other. Gary, Give us your best political analyzation of this. Like, where do you end up on this topic? Were you similar to me about this, where you kind of thought this was like a joke at first, and then you read more about it, and you thought, hey, these guys actually do have a little bit of a point here, these employees? Yeah, I think um, it's difficult to have a, a strong opinion one way or the other if you're a reasonable human being about this kind of stuff anyway. But but, but I, do, I just think like um, about the like the Apollo missions, you go back to like the Cold War and that kind of stuff and technology was being advanced so rapidly during the 60s in terms of the Apollo missions would never have happened if we, we weren't in a space race against directly against Russia okay so I, I think there's sort of a, a similarity with this they're sort of trying to position this as being a, a valuable device device for the military in terms of uh, the future of security for the for the nations you know and if they position it like that they're going to get incredible amounts of funding at the same time i agree i think it's very difficult if you're an employee employee of microsoft and you've been working on this with no level of uh, knowledge about or or never envisioning this this technology being used for anything other than good um you never envisioned it being used to more accurately target an enemy and more accurately kill people then it's got to be a difficult thing if, you, if you're that that way inclined if you're more um you know you, you for example if you were a pacifist or something like that and you work for microsoft which is entirely possible with this new story you could be that kind of person then um i think you would have a very difficult time with that um at and then you know as I, as I previously mentioned you know technology progresses when there is legitimate cause legitimate reason to progress technology to the level that it needs to be progressed to um none of this is ideal you know i, I you know people being killed is is never an ideal situation but um I think it's it's interesting to just have the analogy of the uh, the Apollo missions though because people weren't getting killed with that but a lot of technology that was um, developed during that time was only being developed because it had all this funding because people were terrified of being at war with a country that was progressing beyond them I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a conundrum like none other. I mean, you can't. And Greg's VR in chat says Universal Soldier, brah. <laughs> and it's funny because on Amazon Prime, I noticed they have Universal Soldier on there. That's an old, uh, you know, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren classic from back in the '90s. Uh, but yeah, it's funny because I mean, it's it's not really funny, but. It's kind of true. It's basically Universal Soldier coming to fruition, which is a bit crazy there. But let's see, what else do we got to get into? I mean, yeah, we could we could talk about that all day long. It It's definitely a major conundrum for Microsoft because they have these ethics, you know, they have these like, they have their motto and, and all of that. And then this kind of seems almost like being hypocrite, you know, in a way. And, and I see these employees have a point. And then talk about the timing, very bad timing. I mean, they're in Barcelona, Spain at this very minute, unveiling HoloLens 2.0 to the general public here. And this story just hit yesterday. And it's kind of weird that the story did hit on a Saturday as well. It, like the conspiracy side of me says that there's a lot of media corporations that invest in a lot of things and they might be invested heavily in Microsoft. And the story just happens to hit on a Saturday when no one's paying attention and everybody's out, out and about running around town and it kind of dies. You know, it's, it's one of these things where 
you release a story on like late Friday afternoon or Saturday and and it's completely different than releasing the story on like a Tuesday. It's completely different because so many people are not paying attention and they're doing all kinds of other stuff. So that's kind of interesting. But anyway, why don't we go ahead and move on from that and we can get into a bit of some smaller news. And so Anthony, so, oh. sorry, just just very quickly before we move on to that, because I know we wanted to save some time for Hololens. I didn't know if you wanted okay. to just very quickly talk about it because we it's, it's sort of related news um, at the moment. Th there's not a lot of information we've got here, but I think it's probably worth discussing very briefly um, the Hololens stuff that's just been breaking while we've been doing this show. Um, so basically, they have announced the the second generation of the Hololens, um, and so this was uh, announced in Barcelona in uh, Mobile World Congress and they're saying that it features fully articulated hand tracking and better comfort overall. We've seen some of the leaked images on this as well uh, which were quite interesting because overall I've got to say it doesn't look um, like a massive leap forward in terms of aesthetics from my point of view. Um, comfort wise it's probably better and form factor it's probably slightly smaller i think that's uh that's worth pointing out but at the same time i'm, I'm not sure he actually looks any cooler does anybody else feel like it looks cooler <laughs> I, I don't know seeing some people wearing it on the on the show it actually looks way better than those leaked images like and it also has a flip up feature so you can you can flip up and like be out of it and and then flip back in which i think is cool um, I have some, I've been writing notes on the, <laughs> sorry if I've been a little bit out of it because I've been like writing notes on what I've been watching as well. Um, so what's kind of neat is I think the old one was something like 27 pixels per degree or something like that. Uh, the new HoloLens is 47 pixels per degree. So it's actually like a pretty big step up in resolution. It's also more than double the field of view, which means it's more than 70 degrees, probably very close to 70 degrees, though. That's high, though. Like, I'm happy with that for an AR product. Um, apparently, it's three times more comfortable, according to everybody who wore it. Who knows how you can really, um, you know, think about that. And then the hand tracking thing was really neat because uh, on stage, they were showing off how all 10 fingers are tracked. So, like, someone was playing piano and, like, you can actually do that and like interact with your your holograms just without having a controller just using your hands and it didn't look perfect but i mean damn that would be useful for vr for mixed reality too like full hand tracking right out of the box like you know it, it's exciting to, to think if they could just move some of this stuff over like we could have some really cool vr stuff today um they also seem to say that it would cost a lot less but then they haven't talked about price yet so i'm really hoping like that's also kind of a question. How cheap would this have to be if for you to pick one up just because you think it's so cool? Yeah, I mean, you know what I'll say about it real quick is I believe it does look a lot better. Well, I don't know that it looks a lot better, but I'll say that it's a lot less bulbous because like the first thing I think about when I saw like the original HoloLens and then also like the Meta 2 and like the Avagant and all these different like um, AR headsets, like a lot of them were really, you know, really coming out here, like very bulbous in nature, which is not not the best look. And they've really condensed it down. It is a lot smaller as far as that goes. And the flip up seemed to work very well. That seemed to work well. And also, like what you were saying, Chris, they did kind of do a little video where the guy was was doing stuff and it was showing you the hand tracking live, like right when it was happening. And it looked very accurate. Um, some people are saying $700 for HoloLens 2. That's push the button. I don't know if that's actually, if he's just like wondering, like, could it be $700? But yeah, I don't know that we've gotten an official price. Basically, what's probably going to happen today, because all of this stuff is breaking right now, is like as this day continues, there's probably going to be a, an official HoloLens 2.0 video that is released on YouTube by Microsoft at some point today. And we'll probably get some more detailed information about it, but it's all going to be kind of breaking um, over the next couple of hours. Um, anything else you wanted to say about it, Gary, before we uh, move on? Uh, not really. Just on uh, Chris's point, like the price, I think it's still, it, this is squarely aimed at industry. Um, and we had like a special episode of VR Roundtable with uh, Steve and I when we were talking about um, 
with the uh, Kevin Henderson at Pimax and he was talking like a, a lot of the the market is business to business and that kind of stuff and I just I just feel like Microsoft are not this is not a consumer device this is not they're not aiming for that that market at all so I still envision envision this this being a relatively expensive device um, and it's going to be squarely aimed at industry for businesses um, and it's not we're just not there with AR yet we're just not there for a consumer product unfortunately as much as we would like to be I just don't think we are Gary, yeah. can I ask a bonus question though? Because we don't have this as one of our pieces of news, but there were whispers, there's been whispers about the next Xbox and that VR is not a part of it. There's no VR in the next, like some people are saying there's no VR in the next Xbox. Is there any thought that at some point, HoloLens is going to be a gaming platform at some point, or you just think it's just going to take too many years to get it affordable? There's, I can't see HoloLens ever being a part of that kind of platform, really. I, I don't think AR... I'm one of those people that just sees AR as being for more productivity and practical purposes in everyday life. Eventually, you know, we'll get to it being everyday life. It will replace our mobile phones. It will replace a majority of people having the need to purchase a laptop or a desktop PC or eventually possibly even a TV. You know, if we if it gets to be the as ubiquitous as I think a lot of people would like it to be uh, at these huge companies, then you wouldn't even need a TV because AR glasses can replace all of these things very easily um, but that's a long way off that's not you know that's not probably within the next 10 years even um, but uh, yeah I, 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 I just don't see this being a, a consumer product and that I, I don't know hey Chris a real quick bonus question for you Okay, what if this new hot like let's let's just say for hypothetical reasons that this new HoloLens is one thousand nine hundred and ninety, you know, two thousand dollars. Let's just say it's two thousand, right? They've doubled the field of view. They've gotten it way smaller. They got this new flip up design. Does this kill Magic Leap? Like, like is the real loser here Magic Leap? Because Magic Leap is out there trying to do stuff. And does this just basically kill them dead, or is this battle like got a long ways to go? Uh, they have so much money that the battle probably isn't over, but or the war isn't over probably. But like this battle is completely destroyed. Like uh, Hololens Two is so much better than uh, you know what Magic Leap is putting out. I think like every aspect of it is better, and like Magic Leap doesn't have any finger tracking really. It has that like puck thing that tracks kind of sometimes like not the best where it sounds like this is actually really good it's all built into the headset it just seems like microsoft knows what they're doing with this so yeah i mean i think magic leap is probably hurting today a lot um hopefully they can get a gen 2 out that's as good as this because this is like it leaps and bounds better i think like it's definitely a generational improvement i could imagine like hololens three or four being like consumer ready at this rate of change that they're working at here you know yeah Gary, two quick questions. Number one, do you think Magic Leap, like all of what they were doing, was part of the reason that it like lit a fire under Microsoft's ass, proverbially, you know, in, in terms of like getting this HoloLens 2, 2.0 as good as it is? Like, was a little fire lit under them with that Magic Leap? I'm not sure, honestly, because I think the uh, part, and I think we had a comment in this earlier by uh, Greg's VR. Uh, saying Magic Leap is foolishly going for the consumer market. And honest, I do feel like there's a little bit of truth with that. I, I, I'm not sure the consumer market for Magic Leap, which seems to be their direction, they are, they're not a consumer product, they're a development product at the moment, but it seems to be that their, their angle is a consumer product and the technology doesn't feel like it's there yet. Um, so it's a difficult situation. So with direct, 
what you were talking about there, Anthony, like uh, <laughs> Microsoft progressing with this because of Magic Leap, I, no, there is no way. Microsoft are on their own path with this, in in my mind at least. They they are doing AR at their own pace, and they're again with this, they're playing the long game. It's not like they expect to have a consumer product out within the next five years. Even this is a business device which will be useful for certain very niche industries um at this point um, and they're happy with that you know they're playing the long game again or i feel at least okay yeah i did want to say thank you so much to airwolf deluxe for the super chat very much appreciated thank you so much one little thing i do want to say though on like magic leap and hololens chris you mentioned the little controller I kind of want I want feedback. Like I like it's fine if you take away all controllers from me, but I want to feel some kind of zzz, you know. I want a little bit of rumble. Like how do you do that with just your hands floating in air? We're gonna need some kind of like special air blasting technology. I don't know what the heck we're gonna do, but that is a problem to think about. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our next topic we want to get into. And so Gary wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the future. This, of course, was the book that was released earlier this week. It officially came out. I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday when it officially came out. And this, of course, is the Blake J. Harris, I believe, is the author of that book. And um, Gary, you've you've read some more of it or you've listened to some more of the audio version I unfortunately have not had a chance to to read any more of this. I was fascinated by the stuff that I did read, and I think it was fluke, fluke, uh, fluke Rogi in one like in our Discord server or somewhere in chat somewhere was mentioning that he actually read this book faster than he read Ready Player One. He found it absolutely fascinating mm. and was just totally locked into it. And Gary, why don't you go ahead and talk a little more about it? Yeah, so I'm listening to the audiobook version of this, and uh, yeah, I'm having to tear myself away from it at times just to keep up with the podcast that I've got um, as well. So I'm sort of balancing this, but I'm basically about around about three quarters of the way through the audiobook now, um, and it is fascinating. The the thing that is plain to see this is a very specific narrative of the story of Oculus and Facebook's acquisition of Oculus. I think that's important to say. And you can't take, I think most, most of it, it's, you need to read this book. It's presented in a way where you need to take most of what you say, what what is being said as fact. And there's so many ways to look at any viewpoint. Even a story with, with two characters, you, you have multiple angles to look at that story, different viewpoints, that kind of stuff. And um, I'm not too sure how overall accurate this story is, but it's being it's being told in a very uh, a certain line. There is a certain narrative that is being drawn throughout this story, and I can't even begin to imagine the amount of work that Blake has put in into researching this book and presenting this this narrative that he is presenting in, uh, before us and let me say i'm not saying that anything in this book that i'm reading is entirely inaccurate or anything like that one of the things that stands out to me is that i feel like this book is focused on the primary character is palmer lucky um it does a great job of including everybody else that was around him at that time um, into this story and makes a great job of, of describing how they contributed to this overall product of being the Oculus Rift and their overall acquisition. Palmer Lucky is still sort of the central focus of this, this story. And there is sort of a feeling, sometimes I feel like there are the odd sentence here and there that is a little bit too it's portraying him in this way that a lot of people would like to portray him as being this this myth this this uh, genius this reclusive genius who created virtual reality modern day virtual reality and you read the book and you understand that's not true but there is still this overarching feeling that that Blake is trying to sort of further that impression of Palmer Lucky in some ways, not in every way. And I don't want to be too harsh on, on, on the book in, in that respect, because overall, I love it. I think it's a fantastic, uh, you know, it's so interesting to read. As a VR enthusiast, I think everybody should read this book. Um, but there's just an element that I, I don't 
feel he should have included this such like like feeding into this myth of Palmer Lucky um quite so much as I feel he's done and it's not it's not overwhelming it's not like it's taking over the book or anything like that or making you feel if you didn't already have that impression that that you it, it wouldn't make a new reader coming into this is is thinking wow Palmer Lucky is this this reclusive genius who's done everything for, for modern day VR it's not that kind of thing but if you already have learned that myth of Palmer Lucky and and feel like it's not quite accurate and it's not from my point of view I just feel like this book is open to criticism from that point of view from people that, that feel Palmer Lucky gets far too much credit in modern day VR um I like Palmer Lucky as a as an eccentric character um and as a pioneer of VR um, not, I don't necessarily agree with everything he does or says or anything like that, but um, I, I still find him an interesting character, so I can entirely see why Blake has focused on Palmer Lucky as the central character within this book. There's a lot of points I've, I've got to say about this book, but uh, I think it's probably best to leave it there because I've highlighted basically my main criticism. My main criticism is the fact that it focuses is Palmer Lucky is, is uh, this reclusive genius very slightly not too much but it, it is there it's definitely there uh, i'm looking forward to getting blake on again so i can discuss that with him i think part of that is probably because he had like it, it seems to me like he had more access to palmer lucky than he did anybody else and then he also mentioned that his access to everybody at facebook and oculus just ended abruptly which was probably exactly when Palmer's access got ended as well. So it seemed like, I mean, that it's kind of an explanation for what happened here is like he, if he could have talked to John Carmack a ton and Michael Abrash and Zuckerberg and, you know, somebody over at HTC or something, you know, or somebody at Valve a little bit more, uh, it might be a more fair and balanced book, but he probably had, he mostly probably had access to Palmer because Palmer read Console Wars and liked it. And so, you know, that probably had a lot to do with it. Chris, did you get a chance to read any more of it or hear any more about it? I didn't, but, you know, like you, I, what I did read was very good. And like, I can tell I'm going to love this book. And based on what Gary said, I can tell I'm going to love it. You know, I like Palmer. Like I've, met him in person he seems like a decent enough guy so like i i'm really i think this book is is great for the community and i was surprised there weren't more like people spoiling it on reddit like there really wasn't that much i was worried i would go on there and i'd see all these quotes that were like crazy or something so i i'm i need to dive more into it and you know we'll dive more into it and hopefully have blake on the show again that'd be fantastic one, one thing I would like to say as well, just to clarify, because I felt like like what I was talking about there is very a little bit too critical. Um, and I didn't want it to be this. What I spoke about for the majority of my time there was basically about the, the, the small criticism I had overall about this book in terms of Palmer Lucky. But um, I, I will say that the book does a really good job of the other characters as well around Palmer Lucky. So Brendan Areeb, for example, I knew nothing about Brendan Areeb or Michael Antonov as well. Both of these people were integral in getting the product of the Oculus Rift off the ground. Brendan Areeb, you know, I think is a very interesting character and because I knew nothing about him before, this book paints a picture of him, um, which makes me, you know, it, it's a character driven book. And the fact you start to understand these people, all these big players within this story, um, it makes for it's just, it, it's really compelling. Once you start reading it, you don't want to stop. Um, I really do recommend it. Take it out for what it is. It's a, a particular narrative of this story. Um, now it might not be 100% accurate I'm sure it's as accurate as it needs to be but it's 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 what it it I think it's probably more accurate than I'm giving it credit for <laughs> Gary can I ask you one last question I, I know you're you know you're three-fourths of the way through you haven't read the entire thing yet but is there anything that you've gleaned from this entire book that you do you have any kind of insight towards the future of where oculus is headed like i don't know how much he got into like zuckerberg's mind space and like the brass of oculus now because I'm, unfortunately a lot of the people he's covering aren't there anymore but do you feel like you have any kind of like like a better sense of where you think oculus might be going or 
not really, other than where I think we're all predict <laughs> that Facebook are going and, and, and Oculus is going in terms of standalone and getting just VR into more people's hands and moving, probably moving away from uh, PC to some extent. I, I still, as I said, weeks or months ago when we had MRTV on this, on this show, I still uh, absolutely stand by what I said on that. I still think we will see future PC VR headsets from Oculus and Facebook. Um, but their focus is definitely not in that direction. And I think the book is just sort of backing up that that impression, really. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and move on. So, um, you know, we're going to go right back to Gary again with our next topic. Uh, we wanted to talk just a little bit about the Samsung Odyssey. And so we're talking about the original Odyssey, right? Not the Plus. Because see, here's the thing. We got the Samsung, we got the regular Samsung Odyssey. We've got the Samsung Odyssey Plus. Steve, of course, picked up an Odyssey Plus, was kind of disappointed with it, ended up getting a regular Odyssey, really like that. As far as I know, he's kept his regular Odyssey, but no longer has a plus. Gary, after hearing about all of this and being very tempted by all of this, you ended up picking up a regular Samsung Odyssey. And so you have kind of your impressions with using it for a while and, and how you kind of feel about it, which is good to get these impressions because we've also seen a few sales that have gone on temporarily. Like, Gary, did you see that one sale where it was 249 for like maybe a handful of hours it sold out real fast? But were you like, damn it, I paid more than that? <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> the, I, I wanted to go for the original Odyssey based on what Steve told me about it because um, like Steve, I prefer a slightly crisper image rather than the softer image um, with less screen door because, um, I, you know, I, I'm not quite so sensitive. And this is part of the thing I want to say about the Odyssey overall. Um, I'm not so sensitive about certain problems in VR now, but I am sensitive, probably overly sensitive to certain other things. So screen door effect doesn't bother me too much, um, but lenses I'm finding, lenses are really problematic for me in a lot of headsets. And so this is part of the reason I'm a little bit concerned about the Pimax really, because I hear very in reports about it and like the distortion and that kind of stuff. I'm thinking that maybe I'll, I'll be affected by that a little bit more. Um, but with the Odyssey, everything about the headset is probably among the best uh, uh, from what I've used in VR at this moment. Literally the only thing I don't like about the Samsung Odyssey is the lenses. And this is very subjective. It's a personal thing. A lot of people don't seem to have this problem, but I just have this distortion problem. And I bought it primarily to play something like Elite Dangerous. And with a lot of vertical lines in the cockpit of Elite Dangerous, there's a distortion when I turn my head. And it's not it's not huge, and if this was my ver first VR headset, it wouldn't be a huge problem, honestly. I I'd just sort of accept it for what it is. But because I have a direct comparison with the Vive and the Rift now, I do see it, and it's very difficult to get past. I've I tried adjusting the position of the headset um, numerous times. You know, I've had it for three weeks now, and I've, I've really persevered with it. I just can't get over this. Um, so I, I guess it's more of like a, a personal problem I have with the lenses in this device. I wish we could get just a, a VR headset with the Oculus Go lenses, really. I find them so much better than pretty much everything else that I've used. Um, so I'd, I'd love to get a, a high-end VR headset with those kinds of lenses. Um, Chris, I know you've not had this problem, although just quickly before I pass it over to you, Chris, you mentioned something which was really interesting to me last week. After after the show, you said the Oculus Rift, when I first got that, I mentioned to you behind the scenes as well how I had a similar problem with the distortion. And that's true. It, it's And it's something I thought about even before you mentioned it. Um, and for some reason, I am completely blind to that on the Oculus Rift now. Now, whether I got used to it or I've found a placement on my face that is more suitable where I don't get that dis distortion, I'm not too sure. But with the Odyssey, I've persevered with it. I've had it for around about three weeks. I've really tried to get over this, this problem um, and I can't get over it. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts or sort of recommendations that I could try really. Me? <laughs> yeah, Chris, go ahead. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. Like my Odyssey Plus, I have I don't seem to have any problems with the lenses on my Odyssey Plus personally, other than like the sweet spot being not the biggest thing in the world. So it's such a weird thing, like that, because I don't have any distortion on that headset. I don't think so. It's it's just super weird, you know. Like who knows? It might just be like a weird unit, or it's your head shape. I guess there's just too many variables to to say about it. But man, this must be enticing you for the the Pimax 5K Plus, huh? Because everyone's like. Well, mine's working great. <laughs> yeah, the uh, well, the, yeah. I mean, <laughs> basically, I can come clean now. I've actually sold the Odyssey. <laughs> um, I sold it yesterday. Um, so only because I, I knew I wouldn't, I wasn't going to use it anymore. Um, and I did try to persevere with it, but it's it's not going to happen. So I've sold the Odyssey, but I'm still in the market. You know, I'm still I'm still itching for that next high end VR headset. Um, and I, I want to wait. I want to wait a few more months and see what happens. Um, and let me just reiterate. From a purely objective point of view, I will say the Odyssey is in no means a bad headset. The tracking is flawless, especially the headset itself. There is no problems. It's identical to using a Rift or a Vive in terms of the headset. Obviously, you've got the, the same problems that we all know about with the the uh, the motion controllers because if they're out of view of the cameras and that kind of stuff, we, we all know these problems that you're going to get with this. But even that didn't bother me anywhere close to um, just the lenses. It's literally the lenses. It's so frustrating. Doesn't it suck that we can't just go somewhere locally and try on like nine different headsets and figure out which one is the one we want? See, I'm I'm worried. Like, I don't like the idea of buying something and returning it, especially like, I mean, if I bought it locally, like at a Best Buy down the street or something, that's fine. You know, you just drive back and you return it. But like packaging it up, sending it back, like it's such a major hassle but it seems like all these different headsets, like I'm surprised. So Gary, it it fit you okay. You didn't have a problem with the fit because most people have a problem with the fit. No, that's true. And that's something that I was, I was waiting for as well because a lot of people say about the fit and it's not, look, it's not perfect. The fit is not perfect. But the the angle of the the like the the display sits at is not perfect, but it's it's good enough. And I know there's these little mods that you can do, and I was going to do that if I had a big problem with it anyway. So that wasn't my primary concern. Um, the fit it felt comfortable enough. Um, again, tracking is great. Display overall, the display you can see beyond these lenses, the display is fantastic. Um, if it just had better lenses, uh, yeah. So what do you think about Pimax? Because like one of the things I mentioned when you guys were doing that special episode with uh, with Kevin Henderson is that I don't think I could buy a single Pimax because I, I would be so worried that I would buy it and I would fall madly in love with it. And then a month later, something breaks on it. And then I'm waiting like five months for it to get fixed. And I, I have this feeling in my head where it's like, I would rather not taste the sweet nectar and not even know about it than to taste the sweet nectar briefly and have it taken away from me. And that's why I have this idea where if I was going to get a Pimax, I'd actually have to buy two of them and I'd have to put one back in a closet and leave it all nice and safe back there. And then if something happens to my primary, I got a backup option. And then so while the first one's getting repaired, I got another one that I could use. I know that sounds crazy, but that's literally what I think of in my head. Gary, do you like, is that a concern for you too? Or are you going to like go after a Pimax 5k plus, or are you just going to wait for it to like hit retail channels? I won't be going for one yet because, yeah, I think I need to wait until basically I want to get to a point, and I said this uh, to Kevin before we started the show, I want to get to a point where they're readily available. I want to get to a point where I can go online, order one, and it gets shipped to me within a week. Um, so I'm going to leave it for that. And the support question is something that's come up numerous times with the uh, Pimax as well. But I think they're slowly uh, moving in the right direction with that because they, they have to. They simply have to. And if they don't, they're going to get a ridiculous number of complaints because no headset that is being sort of manufactured this is a kickstarter device any headset that, that is manufactured in that way in that capacity and then moves on to a full product that they want to uh, sell on their website they need to ensure that the support 
after sales service is going to be there and i think that's part of the reason why they they got somebody like kevin uh, involved in that and they he said you know they're going to get somebody else in to uh, the eu as well uh, to support base uh, support in in terms of the eu so it seems like they're they've got all they're playing i, I think honestly that part of the reason with the pimax is it's difficult they're moving so slowly in some ways but so quickly overall when you read this book by Blake, this is like that they had years and years to progress to, to ramp up to this point of a consumer device. Pimax are doing all of this very quickly in the grand scheme of things. And I think it's going to take a while for them to get to the point where they would love to be. Um, I'm still enthusiastic about Pimax. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, actually, is they're like flying by the seat of their pants. Mm. You know, they think of a new idea and then they they redo the headset and they add this new thing in. And then they think of another new idea and then they add it in. But the problem is, I, I believe their heart's in the right place. Like, I believe they really want to bring a great product to everybody and they want it to work great. But when they're iterating so fast and they're making so many different changes, like you don't have the time for the... Uh, quality control, you know, that goes along with that. I think it's going to be a while, man. I don't know. I, I think the Pimax is high risk. I would say straight up high risk product, like be prepared for problems is my thought process. Okay. Um, well, why don't we talk about a few VR games that we were able to play this week? There are a couple of new releases that Just came out quickly oh, sorry ahead. sorry to interrupt again anthony um i did want to because chris put down uh, about the vr Odyssey, uh, cover for the odyssey plus oh yeah um, and i'd love to just hear his impressions on that honestly because um this is something that seems to be getting a lot of uh, interest from anybody that's bought a vr odyssey uh, you know the odyssey plus because of their problems with com with comfort go ahead chris. yeah yeah so I've I've had some spent some time with it. I haven't spent like an enormous amount of time with the VR cover, but what I can say is, uh, you need one if you have an Odyssey Plus. Basically, uh, it it mostly eliminates the problem of there just being this giant light bleed under your headset because it it's always kind of flipped out of your face. It it never is really tied down to your face, and with this cushion, it it has all this extra padding kind of at the bottom to to make it so it's finally enclosed on your face, which was something that was really awesome for me. Um, on top of that, I didn't realize just how uncomfortable the default facial interface was. Like I was like, okay, this is this is nice. Like when I got the headset and, and looked at it and felt it, I was like, this is nice. But taking it off the headset, you realize like this is like a rock hard piece of fabric. Like it, there, there's no cushion to it. There's so it, it can't really hug your face that well. But this. Uh, VR cover one is is so soft and it it's unlike their ones for the Vive where it's like super thin and like you can get closer to the lenses like this thing is really thick and lets you squish it as much as you want which is what this headset really needed because um, like I said that default one was just rock hard and like you couldn't conform it to your face uh, whereas you can with the VR cover so I think it's definitely a, a necessity. It's also really easy to clean, and I'm going to be, you know, using it for when I demo my, my VR game I'm working on, and you know, it's easy to clean, so that's always awesome. Um, I, I think they definitely killed it with this one. I, I still have the problem that, you know, the the top part of the headset is just too low. Like, there's not enough padding like on my forehead. So let's let's hope they can like come up with some extra padding for that part or something. Um, because that's still kind of the main problem for me with the Odyssey Plus is that, you know, everything can be adjusted right, but the lenses are too low on my face still. Um, and that that's what seems to happen to a lot of people. So you kind of just have to put it up here on your forehead, tighten it way too much, and then it, it hurts. Mm. But at least it's, you know, staying in the right place. I heard the Odyssey doesn't have that problem as much, right? Well, no, I, I didn't get that. But I did hear a lot of people where they felt like there was too much pressure on the forehead um, with both the Odyssey and the Odyssey Plus. Um, so I was interested to hear your thoughts on that, actually, Chris. So it doesn't really help that part of it, but it helps. Y you know, what, one of the things with the Odyssey and the Odyssey Plus, so I've heard, is the light bleed. So this helps with that, presumably. Yeah, there's really no light bleed anymore, which is really nice to see. Like, I for, kind of forgot what it's like to not have light bleed because, you know, the Rift has it and <laughs> this has it as well. I've been using the Vive a lot lately. I, I finally got that thing set up again. Um, 
So it's it's weird to go back to trying out the Vive again, man. It's it's so different than the Rift, but. I, I do recommend the VR cover. You know, I, I appreciate them sending it out to us to to try out. And you know, I think if you have an Odyssey Plus, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's not too expensive. I think it's twenty nine dollars. Um, I definitely recommend it. It it's cleaner, easier, and like just gives you way more more comfort on your face itself and reduces light bleeds. So, so it's a so recommend for me. They make good products. I need a Rift one. I don't have a Rift one. I need. I should get a. A rift facial interface because those, those sound really nice. Yeah, I am. Um, go, go ahead, Anthony. Oh no, I was just going to say I, I, I was uh, checking some Hololens stuff real quick. <laughs> okay, are we ready to uh, go to the next story or the next game that we're going to talk yeah, about? Yeah, we want to just quickly talk about the Hololens price because oh yeah, that was announced. <laughs> um, so the price was announced to be 350 per device, or sorry, 3,500. <laughs> Don't Whoops. say that. The ballpark, <laughs> ballpark of three. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, so 3,500 per device, which is more expensive for uh, developers because um, the developer kit of the old HoloLens was 3,000, but it's also less expensive for enterprise because it was 5,000 before, and now it's 3,500 for anybody. Uh, also, you could pay 125 per user per month if you want as well. If you were enterprise and like want to kind of rent them out that way, uh, so damn, it's not it's not 350 dollars. Like that would have <laughs> been nice, but it's definitely enterprise. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and get into some games discussion now? We do have a couple of new releases that came out this week that we wanted to talk about. Uh, the first one is Chroma Gun VR. So this game arrived from Pixel Maniacs. Now, the thing is, Chroma Gun is a flat game that has been available for a while now, but this is the VR version that arrived. And you have to buy the VR. It's a separate game. So, like, if you went to the PlayStation Store, uh, it's 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 on its own, and it's twenty bucks, I believe, sixteen pounds. Chroma Gun VR. Um, Gary, uh, you've played this a little bit. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I actually quite liked it for what it is. Um, and you need to take this in context for what it is. It's a very sort of basic puzzle game to me. Um, so you. Really, what you have to do in this game is you just have it, have this gun, uh, and there are these orbs within a room, and you need to generally move the orbs from one place to another by painting the walls uh, the same color as the orbs in order to get them to sort of gravitate towards that area. Um, and that's really the game. There's there's a lot of puzzles around based around that concept. Really, um, it doesn't look incredible um but it's good enough um it's sort of relatively even for a psvr game it's sort of relatively low resolution um i don't know if you had this anthony when you tried it on because we're playing both playing on a ps4 pro so you would expect it to be sort of a little bit sharper than it actually is especially for how basic the graphics are um but as i progressed through i played it for around about 45 minutes um first off um and i got you know i nothing taxing at all there is there was never a point where i was stuck in this game and reading a little bit more about it i've sort of got the impression that it doesn't get too taxing at any point throughout this game it also doesn't change too much the environments don't change too much as well um which i suppose really is sort of understandable it needs to keep to this sort of relatively um sparse look in order for you to do these puzzles in a way that you have to do them because you have to paint walls so you need to see the walls very clearly you need them to be white and, and this kind of stuff it, it makes sense for the kind of game it is um i did enjoy it I, i'm not gonna lie you know I, I i thought it was a really you know relatively enjoyable game for what it is i think you just need to be very aware of what this game is and not expect too much from it did you play it with uh, the aim controller? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And I did like that. And one thing you've just reminded me of one point I wanted to hit on, Anthony, with this. Um, so with the aim controller, there's the performance is fine for the most part, but it, it suffers from this thing where 
and the aim controller seems to make it more apparent for me where you move the aim controller and you get this kind of reprojection sort of blur which you get in some uh, PSVR games um, which is fine but it sort of edges to the point of everything is blowing so you can move your head from side to side and see these characters within this game as well at the beginning of the game you have this uh, NPC um, and if you move your head from side to side she blurs your gun blurs everything blurs and it's the performance to me feels slightly under par to where I feel it should be for this how basic the, the game looks it's obviously running at 60 frames per second and then being sort of interpolated to this uh, 120 that the PSVR does but um, I just it's not the ideal way for it to run in my opinion yeah, yeah. So I played this as well, and I liked it. Um, I, the graphics are not good. They really are not. It's, in fact, like what you said, Gary, we already expect lower-end graphics to begin with, and this is even lower than that. Uh, the graphics are pretty bare bones, and there is a lot of blurriness. I didn't think about the gun angle as far as the blurriness, but... Um, the thing I liked about the game, though, is I really love the announcer guy, like the snarky announcer. I think he just does an absolutely fantastic job. He's got this great radio voice, and it's just so clear and crisp. Uh, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of Portal. It, it has a little bit of that that snarky humor that you got in Portal with GLaDOS. And, I, I mean, obviously they were going for that. That was a big part of it. And the, the environments are sterile and not a lot going on. And, and kind of what Gary said, it kind of has to be white because you're going to be painting all these different colors and mixing and matching colors. So you kind of do need this sterile environment. The thing, though, is we've seen sterile environments on PlayStation VR done exceptionally well. For example, Static by Tarzier Studios is a, is a very sterile environment. You're inside like a laboratory, but it is done very well. I thought they did a very good job with the graphics on that. And then also Spark by CCP Games, another very sterile portal S type of environment that I think is pretty clean and pretty crisp. And Chroma Gun VR, if you're a graphics whore, you probably want to pass. It is not a graphically intense game by any stretch of the imagination. It's a, it's a relatively simple puzzle game, I had fun. You know, I had fun. I don't know. Maybe part of it is that I'm using the aim controller. And so maybe there is a bit of a novel. Like, I still haven't played that many aim controller games. I got my aim controller for use with Firewall Zero Hour. And I played that with my aim controller uh, a little bit. Then I got Farpoint and played that with my aim controller. And then I think this is like the third thing that I played with my aim controller. And so it's kind of one of these things you get an aim controller and you might start going out of your way a little bit to try to get another game here or there that uses it, you know, because it's kind of like that justify thing, right? You want to see, yeah, my aim controller is really coming in handy because I'm using it for all these different games. And so maybe that made the game seem a little bit better to me because, you know, I have my my aim controller there, I'm moving through this world, I'm painting things, and and I see my controller, it's modeled in the game, and for the most part, it works pretty well. Every once in a while, you got to shake your controller to get the tracking back on target. Yeah. Well, one thing, uh, Anthony, on that, like the, the aim controller, because basically I'm the same as you, really. I've played Farpoint, I've played Firewall with the aim controller, and then this, I can't think of anything else that I've played with the aim controller. And like you said it's it's partly because i do want to use that device which was relatively expensive for what it is and i think um i i like the aim control it's not that i don't like it i just don't think like pretty much everything it's it's almost like a it sort of sums up this generation of psvr for me the aim controller is is good but it's not quite there <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the tracking is just not quite there with the aim controller. You do have to sort of bring it up vertically, shake it a little bit, get it back on track, and then you're okay for another three minutes or whatever, and then you have to do it again. And it's not, again, it's not terrible. It's just it's not quite where it needs to be. And this is one of the things I think PSVR really needs to tackle. The, the tracking of their motion control is, is just subpar. And the more I use them, the more I feel like that. Yeah, you know, part of the thing about the aim controller, too, is like when it does work, it's really cool. 
And so you're mo- like, if you're in Farpoint or whatever, and you're moving your gun around, you're look, you're examining your gun and you're turning it and it's moving perfectly with you. It really does buy you into that experience. So the second the tracking goes haywire, it is jarring as can be. Gary, I don't know if you notice this, but I think Chroma Gun, I've noticed there's a number of PSVR games that will show you your cone of vision. Did you notice this with like Farpoint and Chroma Gun are two of them that jump to mind? Like if you move your controller too high or your head goes up too high, you will actually see, you'll literally see your cone of vision, which I think is a great idea because it shows you, you know, okay, you want to back up a little bit to give your cone of vision a little more room or whatever it is, or, you know, or raise your camera up a little bit. But yeah, it, you see that cone of vision and you realize that's where the problem is. You know, this is what Sony's going to have to deal with. And it is frustrating because when it works, ah, it feels so good. And then when it breaks, it really upsets you. Um, but Jay, I just wanted to say my, my final closing thoughts for Chroma Gun VR is if you're a puzzle fan and you have a PlayStation VR and you don't currently have a puzzle game, I, I actually recommend this for 20, but uh, you also can't be a graphics whore. So there's a lot of conditions right there. But if you're not a graphics whore, you're looking for a puzzle game, you haven't had one in a while, for 20 bucks, I think you could do a hell of a lot worse than Chroma Gun VR. I liked it. I still think it's a good game. I want to go back in and play it some more. Is it the best thing since sliced bread? No. Does it remind me a little bit of Portal? Yes. Does it remind me a little bit of Talos Principle VR? A little bit. You know, so that's kind of my thought. Just um, yeah, yeah. Just um, very quickly to fin- finalize this game, I I think the price is not insane for a PSVR game because they're a little bit higher priced anyway. I think this is probably worth picking up for around ten pounds. You know, maybe I don't know twelve dollars, something like that. I'd, I'd recommend it, but for the current price, I'd I'd say it's not quite there for me personally. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of games you can get for 20 bucks, so it does make it a little bit harder because it's like, well, I could get this for 20 bucks. Do I really want this halfway decent uh, puzzle game? Okay, so let's go ahead and go on to our next one, and the good news is Chris played this one, so we'll be able to talk to Chris about it too. Okay, so Dick Wild 2. This game, I believe, arrived, uh, was it Tuesday? I, I can't remember when these things came out, but it, probably Tuesday. The developer is Bulwark Games. This game is also going for 20 bucks, and it's also going for 16 pounds. Now, there is, I believe, like a launch discount, so you can get it a little bit less than that, like around 17, 18 bucks or something like that. Um, of course, Dick Wilde, the original, came back, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, and it's kind of a standard issue wave shooter the original dick wild very colorful we tried that game out because i believe we got a code a long long time ago for vr roundtable we all tried dick wild one we all kind of liked it but we all you know also knew you know hey it's a wave shooter um but chris i don't know if you're new to the franchise of dick wild i don't remember if you played the original one back when we did or maybe you did but what's your thoughts after playing this new one do you like it I do like it. Uh, I think it's very similar to the first one. So if you like the first one a lot, you'll like this. I mean, you know, let's be honest here. It's a wave shooter and it it doesn't try to hide that like this. They're trying to make one of the, the most fun, intense wave shooters ever, I think. And like that does come through. It's very polished. Everything's really well done. The sound's well done. I thought uh, the environments are really well made. I like uh, in, in this game you're on a raft and the raft is moving down the river, so you you actually kind of moving through the level, which is fun. In a ways, it's like an on rail shooter, but it, it feels more like you know you're just floating down a river. So I like the environment of that and how they how they chose to have uh, like fish jumping out of the water and everything. Um, there's also boss fights, and I, I don't know there might have been boss fights in the first one, but. Uh, they're they're pretty fun as well. Um, like there's crab, like a big old crab and stuff. When you're going down the river long enough, you'll encounter bosses. Um, a big thing with this one is that you can do co-op now, so you can you can uh, pair up with your friends and fight together, which I think would be really fun. Like that would be a lot a lot of fun to just uh, kind of screw around and shoot all this stuff uh, with a friend. Um, 
I, I just uh, stopped playing it because at the end of the day, it's a wave shooter and it is one of the best wave shooters. If you like wave shooters, then like definitely you should get this game. And it, it looks like uh, Jim Hall just said in the chat that the devs are playing to add more content as well. Um, so it's one of the best wave shooters, I would say. That's just really not my kind of genre to stay in for a while. Uh, but I enjoyed my time with it a lot, and it, you know, it's a very polished game. I was surprised how few reviews there are. Like, I feel bad for these guys. You know, it came out Tuesday, and there's like three reviews so far. Like, I, I, you would have hoped they would have been doing better, you know. Uh, so I recommend it, though, if anyone likes wave shooters at all. Gary, uh, did you get a chance to play this? Okay. Oh, Gary, you're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, there we go. There's a little problem. We've got that out of the way now anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so just, just quickly, I didn't play Dick Wild 2, but um, from the perspective of, of a consumer that, that played the first one, I just feel like this game, you know, why would I pick up the second one? It looks so similar. It looks almost like the same game, really, with a few new levels. Um, so maybe you can convince me, Anthony. Um, are we, cause Chris Richardson is saying everyone is muted, but did you take that off maybe, or are we okay now guys? We got a little bit Should of delay okay, here, so we'll have hopefully. to find out. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead and talk about Dick Wild too. And hopefully my voice is coming through right now. Um, so I did, okay. It's working now. Okay, good. Okay, so I did play Dick Wild 2. I actually have played this game a couple of different times over the last couple of days. I did a Let's Play as well on my channel, if you want to check that out, VR365. And honestly, I mean, I the game, there's nothing wrong with the game, is what I would say about it. But there's nothing extraordinary about the game either. Because like, if I'm going to play a wave shooter... like I, I've played so many wave shooters since the beginning of VR that the only way I can get into another wave shooter is if something interesting is being done. Like if there's some interesting kind of angle to it or if the gameplay has been executed like flawlessly or so, like there has to be something special going on with it. Just a standard issue wave shooter. I just don't think that's going to cut the mustard for me anymore is what I'm trying to say here. And then also the other thing I'm going to say is I probably, I think I just suck. I just suck at this game because I never saw a boss. I never got to a boss because I suck that much that I didn't even get to a boss. One of the things now, what I will say though, as far as the good news on this game, it is sharp, it is clear, it is colorful, it is crisp. I played this on my Oculus Rift. It is the Steam VR version. This is also, of course, on PlayStation VR, and it actually does support the aim controller. So if you get it on PSVR, you can use your aim controller. But um, it's super clean and super crisp, very nice. The sound effects, the polish, everything is there. This is one of these things, like on the good side, You'll have these different games that are going for 18, 19, 20 bucks that are these indie games that don't have much polish, like the option menus and the sound effects, like things don't work out so well. And when you get a game that is nicely polished, you can appreciate that. And I appreciate that with Dick Wild too. But again, I just honestly like, like I don't have any incentive to go back in there and continue to play it. Now, is this a case of me just hating wave shooters and just not wanting to play wave shooters anymore? That's part of it. But I will say there's some wave shooters I've absolutely fallen in love with, like Blasters of the Universe. And yes, DLG27 in chat says another vote for Blasters. And Great Tantrum says the best wave shooter I ever played was Blaster of the Universe. And I have to absolutely agree with that because the thing about Blasters of the Universe is you're playing a wave shooter. It's You can't get around that. It is a wave shooter, but it's the way you're playing the game, the 
you have to think like you really have to use your head in terms of like, okay, I, I've got to like move my body. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got shields. You know, I activate my shields. I've got to shoot. Like there's like strategy that's going on where for me, when I'm playing Dick Wild 2, the strategy is shoot, 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 and shoot a hell of a lot more, you know, and constantly shoot. And then the other little weird issue I had and this might just be me, like I have a problem with this, is like you're holding a gun in each hand, right? And so initially when I first started, like there would be some bad guys and I would take both of my guns together and I would aim it at the same bad guy and just be shooting both of my guns at the same bad guy, which is really easy for me to do for my little pea brain. It's like, yeah, just aim at one thing and shoot it. Where what I'm really supposed to do in this game, and I think you'd probably get a lot further in this game, is if your left gun... You're shooting stuff that's like on the left side of the screen. And your right gun, you're shooting stuff on the right side of the screen. So you got something coming at you this way, something coming at you that way. And you kind of like get them in a spot where you're like shooting both of them at the same time. And if you can do that, you progress through the game a lot faster. For me, I don't know. There's something about it's hard for me to do that. Like I was trying to do that and it and I did get a little bit further into the game, but I still never saw a boss. And at the end of the day, I just think I suck. I just suck at this game. So it was hard for me to enjoy it in a major way. But that's my thought on Dick Wild 2. Okay, um, Chris, you did play something called Rainbow Reactor. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that before we check out of here? Yeah, so you know this game is pretty easy to describe. It's, basic, it's basically like a match three puzzle game, but in VR. Um, the graphics are fantastic. It's in this like really weird steampunk environment. I don't know what that relates to any of this it's just in this really cool environment um it seemed like the developer's purpose was to make a game that was really easy to jump anybody in and they would enjoy it uh, it's like a, a quick game that you can jump in for a few minutes and have fun with and that's what i did I, I played probably 15 20 minutes of this game i didn't play too much um but i got the gist of it so uh, it's kind of this hexag hexagonal uh grid where you can throw balls that are coming at you and they're colored balls and then you throw them onto the board and you try to match three or more and you get high score that way and you're just kind of trying to aim to get the highest score um so i thought just like you know that's what it is i think it's great for what it is as long as you know like okay this is a match three puzzle game in vr uh it's actually pretty fun and, and enjoyable to play um so you, you lose uh you have strikes and if your balls hit the ground uh, then you you lose uh, lives basically. So uh, you know that happened to me a few times. It's the the balls start to come in quicker and quicker from each side. So you have to start really just chucking them on the board and hoping that you know you get another color that is related to them. Um, something I hadn't got into as well, but I've seen in the trailers is that you can mix colors together eventually. So eventually there's going to be these other colors. So you have like a red and a green, and you want to mix that together uh, to make another color so it kind of gets into the strategy element at some point too um but yeah just just knowing what it is it's a fun match three game that anyone can really play and i thought the throwing was fantastic like you know i need to take people need to take notes from this game because you throw and it goes like exactly where you want it to go every time somehow i don't know how they do that uh but you know it was just so perfect how i'd throw it it'd be there it, it mat i'd match three or whatever and uh yeah, I, I, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to progress through a match three game. Um, but I don't know. That being said, I don't know if it's if it's worth $10. This feels more like a $5 game to me just because, you know, it's a match three. There's not too many variation in anything. Uh, but it is polished. It is well done. So, you know, we can give props to that at least. Hey, Chris, I'm looking at the trailer here. And I was, I haven't heard of this game. I really haven't been tracking this game. I didn't know what it was and didn't get it. But looking at this trailer, it looks really good in the trailer. Would you say that the actual game itself matches what the trailer is showing? Yeah, the graphics are really good. And it's it's weird because you wouldn't expect them to be so good in a game like this. But they're, they're fantastic. Um, I think... You know, they need to do it's early access. Uh, so I think they need to do a little bit more work on the hand position because with the touch controllers, like I'm holding them, you know, at a, a 90 degree angle and they're kind of flat on the ground or like the hands are 90 degrees the wrong way. 
so I think there's some polish that needs to be done. But for early access, like I think this is a good first entry into VR. Like I'm I'm proud of these developers because it's it's just a team of four people. So it's good for their first game, I think, and it is enjoyable. Um, if if people like Match Threes or if they liked Angry Birds VR, where it's kind of like a mobile phone game ported to VR, that's basically what this is. So it, it's cool to check out. All righty. Well, I guess that pretty much is going to do it for our show today. That's going to wrap it up for episode 114 of VR Roundtable. Uh, one of the things we will ask everybody out there is if you are a listener to our audio podcast on iTunes or any of the other podcast services, we really could appreciate, well, we really would appreciate uh, any kind of reviews that you could do because what it does is the more reviews that we get, it helps other people notice the show. And that is important to be sure. Also, we appreciate, you know, go ahead, like the video, subscribe to our channel. We also notice a lot of people watch these videos and aren't subscribed. Just go ahead and hit that subscribe button because we will not hammer you with a million different videos. We really only do one a week, although we do every once in a while have a special episode like we did this week back on Wednesday we do, of course, have a special episode that you guys might want to check out if you didn't know about it. Gary and Steve did an awesome interview with Kevin Henderson of Pimax. A lot of interesting questions. They really fired those hard, difficult questions at him. And uh, it was a pretty good interview. Lasted like two hours or something. It was a long, in-depth interview. So if you somehow missed that, be sure to double back and check on that. Alrighty, guys. Well, I guess we'll see everybody next week. So have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Later. Bye.